Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing how to shift the education system in America to level the playing field for all America's children with our special guest, Makisha Nation of Teach for America of the Twin Cities. Makisha, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Mark. So, Makisha, this is one of my favorite topics, right? Kids and education combined, right? It covers such a broad, broad area. So I'm going to set this up just with a couple of stats here. Uh, America's children receive an uneven education at best with school quality and student access to resources pretty much aligned to where wealth is in the country. So that by fourth grade level, there's a 24 month gap in reading level and an 18 month gap in math level for kids growing up in poverty versus their higher income counterparts. And if you if you sort of take that over to the eighth grade, and my grandfather quit school at eighth grade in order to work to support his family, uh, that gap has widened to three years for reading and more than three years in math. And annually, 1.3 million students drop out of high school, and most are low income, and students of color drop out at over twice the rate of white students. And that's basically aligned to the poverty rate in the United States, where poverty actually hits. So can you talk a little bit about your take on this problem? It's a national problem, but it has regional resonance. And even within regions, right, it's clustered with certain communities, certain geographies, certain ethnicities. Could you talk a little bit about how you see this this really important uh, challenge that we confront in America uh, for our own prosperity and our own development as a country? Sure, Mark. And I'll start a little bit just with my own personal journey and how I connect to this work. And I think it's a pretty much a microcosm for what we're seeing in America. So I migrated to the States, for example, when I was six um, and um, moved to Connecticut uh, at the time, but had a lot of challenges in that early experience. And, you know, if it wasn't for someone reaching out and tell my mom, hey, you actually have to test her, they were going to keep me back in kindergarten or put me in special education. So already our education system made assumptions about me because I was from a small island country and what I was capable of and what assets I brought to bear as a student showing up in the school system. So imagine force fast forward now, you know, 30 some years later, I'm a mom myself. I have three boys. Um, And my first, my oldest was starting kindergarten and he had a very disruptive early kindergarten experience. Um, And I talked to the teacher about that. And um, I was concerned that his reading wasn't progressing the way I wouldn't want it to be. What I was told as a parent at that time was like, make sure you're reading to him every night. Well, I've been doing that since he was, you know, babbling. So that wasn't the issue. Um, And basically the teacher dismissed that initial um, concerns that I had. It wasn't until his first grade teacher, again, a teacher that's just 20 steps away from where his kindergarten teacher sat down with us and said, we actually need to intervene here. And here's some skills and tips I can teach you as a parent. Here's some things that I could work in the classroom. And he went from reading seven words a minute to 70 words in a minute, right? So a lot of the challenges and struggles we have in our education system come out from a system that is not fully designed to see all of our students and their potential and their capabilities, and from the fact that we need more high quality instruction and support for educators. I think about how my son was able to gain so much from that first grade teacher who understood how to unlock his capacity to read. And it was tremendous to see him go through that growth so much so that when his little brother was getting ready to start kindergarten, he was like, I need to sit down with you this summer and make sure you learn because in kindergarten, I didn't learn to read. And it really created a lot of difficulties for me. That is happening across the board, across our country, specifically in low income communities, specifically in classrooms where there's a majority of students of color. We are not fully um, making sure that kids learn to read by the time they get to third grade so that they're leaning to reading to learn by the time they get to third grade and beyond. And that is causing a significant shift in disparities in terms of what students have access to high quality education, high quality learning instruction, and what students do not. And there's this things that we real, do. Mm-hmm. And this has a real impact. So when I was a kid, I grew up in an economy that was very balanced. There was manufacturing. I had manufacturing jobs. I had warehouse jobs. I had a lot of jobs that nowadays have been outsourced overseas to uh, lower uh, wage countries. And now we're in a knowledge economy. So when I was coming up, I was a very slow reader. I was very slow to speak. 
um, wouldn't know it now, but but that is the truth. And I was given time and I was able to get jobs uh, initially uh, based on the fact that I could focus and I had physical labor and so on and so forth. Nowadays, a lot of those jobs are not here. It's a knowledge economy. So if you don't have math and you don't have verbal skills and you don't have the ability to interact with technology or absorb training, it really, really hurts you. If you're a little slow, like I am, right? It really, really hurts you, doesn't it? It does. And I think the connection between uh, education and e- economic mobility is really key. You know, Teach for America set out set out a goal in the next 10 years. We want to see twice as many of the students and communities we serve not only hit those key educational milestones, but we're developing the social and emotional learning skills to help folks have greater access to economic mobility. And this was an important tipping point for us because of a lot of what you said. You know, the literacy foundational skills are so critical. The right. numeracy skills are so critical. And then what we're seeing now now is that the ability for students to apply that learning in team-based projects, all these things that we know are really critical as folks move into the 21st work, 21st century workforce is, is really important. And then we also know on top of that, um, the way technology is being utilized in this day and age requires a, a stronger skill set in that area as well. So if we want our, our young people to be competitive for the jobs of the future, we have to have those foundational skills. And then knowing that we work, we live and operate in a global economy, um, you know, students being able to speak multiple languages is also really important. So a lot of times when I look at the diversity of students here in Minnesota, I'm like, we are so well poised to um, have talent that can really be competitive in this economic landscape if we are providing the right foundational context for learning and growth. And then there's also the executive function skills that that go beside the learning skills, right? It's time management. It's it's, uh, quality uh, work, understanding where quality needs to be upgraded. Because if you have that kind of consciousness, if you have those kinds of management uh, skills, then you can manage your own time wisely. You can manage the the flood of information that's coming to us through all of our devices, all of these these things, and so on. And you can then parse. You can eliminate. You could you could get the things that are just chatter and move those to the side. You can focus. Talk a little bit about how Teach for America teaches that combination of skills. So basic reading and writing, basic math. And those other kinds of skills that are that you mentioned, some of which are things like emotional intelligence and so on, but also the whole idea of time management that together create the whole person. Yeah. So, you know, Teach for America's mission is to make sure that all students have access to an excellent education. And we do this by recruiting a diverse um, education workforce and training those teachers. And I think from day one, in just how we're selecting teachers and identifying educators, we're looking for that mindset where our our future educators are going to be focused on deep learning for all of our students. Um, They're going to be very familiar with working with students from low-income backgrounds, students that are growing up in poverty, and also approaching it with the assets-based mindset, their skills and talents that students already bring to the table. So selecting the right folks is the first part of the battle. The next part is- Can I pause you? Can I pause you there? Because- Yeah, yeah. This is a really important point, right? This is where diversity is a superpower, Mm -hmm. right? Somebody who comes from a particular background might be able to identify issues that a child has that somebody who comes from a different background can't. Now, that doesn't necessarily align to race. It's not about, you know, Black teachers understanding or, or the only people can understand a Black kid. Mm -hmm. or a Latin Hispanic teacher only being able to understand Latin Hispanic kids. What it means is that diversity surrounding the kids with these different perspectives, different viewpoints, different lived experiences, the teachers can then come together as in your case and as in your child's case, they can come together and have these discussions and figure out the best. So diversity, diversity of perspective, diversity of analysis is a superpower for these children, isn't it? It is. I mean, and if you think about it, we've we're seeing more and more reports on companies that, you know, a company with diverse boards, diverse workforce actually are, are performing better in terms of key economic indicators. So it's not surprising for me that a diverse uh, school or diverse educators in the school system actually have the ability to have an outsized impact. Some of it is the referencing and um, representation does matter. Kids like me that see teachers like me in front of the classroom, that is going to matter to them. But what studies have shown is that 
Having a diverse educator workforce also correlates to increased um, attendance at school, a decline in discipline um, uh, issues. Um, you see growth gains in both reading and in math. And it does that gains don't happen just for black students. It happens across the board, even for white students in a diverse educator environment. Part of it is about, you know, making sure the students feel holistically seen and represented. The curriculum that then shifts to be very more, much more inclusive of the entire school, student body and teachers and leaders that are from the community or have very close familiar familiarity or proximity to the community that can then problem solve and, fall and come up with unique ways to partner with their families and with their community members. I've seen the benefit of that. Um, we've had a couple of core members that you know came from Minneapolis public schools that are now teaching in the Twin Cities. We have um, a Somali educator that taught at the school that she went to when she was in the second grade. Think about how powerful that is when you're trying to navigate family relationships, community relationships, when you have context on the community and context on what the students everyday lives li lived experiences like. It allows you to think up new solutions and new ways to get through to families and new ways to build partnership. And I think we've, we're starting to see incredible benefits from that with our um, education community here in the Twin Cities. Well, particularly when you talk about language, right? When you when you talk about people who come from different places, and, and particularly in the United States, Spanish is is such a strong linguistic thread, right? You have English, you have Spanish, then you have a whole multitude of other languages. I wish I spoke Spanish. I speak German and I speak English, but I wish I spoke I spoke Spanish. I wish my my kids now wish that they they had taken Spanish, which I. Out of uh, a slight envy as an adult, I would say, take Spanish, take it. They would say, no, dad, no. But now they're like, God, I wish I spoke Spanish. And that really equips you from a career perspective at, in an advantageous state, whether you are going to be employed by or employing other people, being able to speak a major, major language group here in the United States is a real advantage. How do you deal with these, these debates about whether multilingual education is good or bad, or or you know, how do you how do you honor different uh, traditional threads uh, while creating this this sense of of America, which is also uh, embedded in our language and how we speak to each other and how we communicate. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think for me on the personal side, um, you know, my kids started in Spanish immersion for pre-K preschool. Um, and a lot of speaker? I, I am I am I'm solid. I'm not proficient as much as I would like to, but I, I studied Spanish. I studied abroad in Mexico. So I'm always like rusty. My kids will correct me every once in a while. That's but good. Part, of, part of it was this desire for us to be a more holistic and inclusive community. And part of it was for me, I knew they were more likely to have diverse educators in an immersion environment in their early childhood experience. And oh, that's um, interesting. So, so that was one were, of the reasons. You, you were helping your kids to go on a Spanish thread because you felt that that would give them access to more perspectives amongst their teachers. That's a really, that's really an interesting, that's, yeah. that is walk in the talk, right? Yes, yes, yes. And I think what I appreciate about it, they went to Casa de Corazon and they had a very global curriculum. So from a very early age, my son, Marcellus, who's now nine, could point to a flag from a country in Latin America or South America and tell you what country it was on site, right? So you think about the power of that fast forward when he's in college and some many, many years from now um, and has built that skill, but also this appreciation for understanding and valuing culture. America is a country that's made up of people from different backgrounds and different nationalities. The Twin Cities, I often say, our diversity is more diverse than you would even think. We have uh, a strong um, Latin American community here um, from Mexico, from Central America, South America. We also have the Hmong community here. Um, and we also have a strong and significant East African community. We are one of the states that was very open when um, refugee resettlement was happening in the 80s and 90s. And that diversity is here as part of a rich social fabric of this community. Um, but to me, you know, we have to be able to understand the strength that that brings. And that's why language is so important. I think about newcomers that come to this country. A lot of my teachers will have a ninth grader or a seventh grader that this is they've been in the country six months before they start school in the school year. And so they need to understand the linguistic strengths that they have in their home language 
right? And also be able to help them with learning English as fast as possible, because we know that they're going to work and in, operate in an English dominant environment. But we do that with a way in a way that honors and preserves their native language and also continues to build their skills and competence in their native language. So it's a both and it's neither either or, right? We really want to make sure we're doing that. And I have an amazing alum for example, Day Sensor, who runs an EDL program, English language development program at Perdeo Academy here. And they have seen record results in terms of getting kids up to proficiency in English and exiting them out of English language development programs. And to me, the beauty of that is providing the right supports, early intervention, thoughtful intervention actually accelerates their learning. And you can do that in a way that doesn't strip away the culture and the heritage of students, which is so important to their identity development. And let's look at how important that is for the country. If you take a look at the development of the world, Africa is a really important place, not only for extractive industries, but just for economic development and global diplomacy, for the health of, of the world's environment. Africa is so very important. Now, we have always benefited in this country from multilingual communities that are able to connect, be American, carry our values, but also connect internationally and spread throughout the world and create partnerships, which they're only able to do because of the education they receive, the acceptance they receive, the freedoms that they receive, the ability to grow and spread their wings. And it all starts with education, doesn't it? It does. It does. And I think understanding um, that we live in a global community and what that means in terms of access to resources, you know, uh, I think about the complete curriculum that tells us the story about America and where we are as a country, but also the importance of understanding how interconnected we are to a lot of other countries across the world. I remember um, my first time going to visit Nigeria for a friend's wedding and just being really struck by the innovation and entrepreneurship that was happening in that country and understanding kind of the, the geopolitical climate that they operated. When students have an opportunity to connect what they're learning to real life experiences, it really creates um, you know, more opportunities for them to think about their career tra tra trajectory, their future, um, and to foster kind of deeper dialogue and understanding. A lot of times people will say, well, do well in school, get a good education, then you go to college. And I think what our students are asking us, especially coming out of the pandemic, is how is what I'm studying now relevant to what I will do in the future? And teachers that really have that unique ability to connect those, those learnings and those experiences and that exposure help students understand and start to carve that path for themselves as early as middle school. You know, well, and you want to see so innovation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, solar power was in Israel way before, like 30, 40 years ago, way before the United States. If you look at Nigeria, Kenya or whatever, uh, 15, 20 years ago, they were already using cell phones in the way that we are just now using cell phones to communicate. We were so wedded to our hardwired networks because we had the infrastructure and our telecommunications networks. Now we're we're upgrading. But, you know, it hit Africa before way before the United States. If you take a look at, at solar as a sort of a micro solution, not infrastructure driven, not centralized, but micro solutions or other solutions to moving water uh, to arid land, lands, a lot of those are created by inventors in these countries. And that's where the collaboration could be uh, so very powerful. I'd like to ask you a question about history, because yes. we're seeing this movement in the United States where um, the teaching of history is, is becoming um, legislated in a way that that uh, preserves sort of a 1950s view of, of how history is taught, which is uh, to look away from the tragedies uh, that, um, that informed um, uh, European and Native American interactions during the hundreds of years that that unfolded. It basically turns away from the history of slavery or from the internment camps that uh, Japanese citizens were forced to uh, inhabit uh, at the Second World War time or some of the other injustices. And we don't we're not we're not allowing uh, particularly young students to be exposed to their history, although those history those histories are carried within their families. How does Teach for America navigate this very complicated web of feelings that people have in a way that that holds true to your educational values? Or do you just sort of finesse it by focusing on reading, writing, and arithmetic, you know, that kind of thing, 
and you try not to deal with with that issue. No, I mean, for a long time, uh, Teach for America has been on the forefront of recruiting diverse educators and also thinking about what diversity, equity and inclusion means in the context of our education system. Here in the Twin Cities in particular, I would say in the last four or five years, we've really um, oriented towards how do you go beyond diversity, equity and inclusion to actually think about anti-racism in practices and what does that look like in the classroom? What does it look like when you're training educators? Um, for example, we hope we posted a DEI keynote event in our community every year. We just had Isabella Wilkerson here in Minnesota because of the unique complexities in Minnesota in particular. Yeah, her, she was, her book on cast, right? Yes, her book was on cast. Yes. And um, we talk about the fact that Minnesota is a tale of two states, depending on your economic background, the color of your skin, your ethnicity and origin, you can have a completely different set of experiences here in the education system, in the healthcare system, in housing. And so it's really important for us to actually bring people together to understand our history and how um, our societal constraints are impacting access to opportunities even to this day. And so I, to borrow kind of a metaphor that Isabella Wilkerson, Isabel Wilkerson uses, um, if you got a new house and you bought this house, you wouldn't just take it as face value that everything is OK. Right. You'd have somebody come in, inspect it, kind of understand what's going on. And then you come up with solutions for the things that are happening, like, hey, the wiring needs to be redone. Hey, there's this issue with the plumbing. In some ways, America, whether we were here or direct benefits from our history of slavery or internment camps or a number of the injustices that have happened, it still plays out in some aspect of our society today. So our ability to understand and unpack this and also think about what needs to be changed moving forward is really critical to the future success. If you look at cultures and things that you, you mentioned, your history, your connection to Germany and German language, um, or even in South Africa, there was this kind of truth and reconciliation process to help people heal and understand and help people move forward in context together. Our ability to have these conversations to be in deep dialogue about solutions oriented approaches is going to be critical to this next generation. And then the other thing I would tell you, Mark, is my kids will find the information anyway. Right. So a lot of times the adults fear that kids aren't ready to have this conversation. And what I have seen from my own eyes with my own young people in my community is that they are actually ready to have this dialogue and this discussion, and they want to operate in more racial and ethnic harmony across cultures. And they know how critical that is to the world that we live in because of the changing demographics of the United States. And so I think in some ways we need to take a page out of their book and create the right context and kind of move beyond this place where books are being banned and libraries can't carry certain things when people are really just trying to provide a context for us to understand the history that has happened in our country. The question really becomes who owns American history? Who does own American history? I mean, we all own it. That's the reality we of it. All, all we all own it. Your like history, I'm a Jamaican immigrant and are, I own it. Say that again? Your history and my history, they're intertwined. Yes. Right? And our futures are you, intertwined. And that's you what- You own my history and I own your history because we're both Americans, right? And so so we have to, we have to include this in basic education because it really turns on children to learn about themselves, not to learn about somebody else. If, if, if I am a- a uh, a kid who is um, whoever it is it do doesn't matter from from an African American family a, a Latin Hispanic family from a Chinese family a Hmong family um, a white European family we should be learning about those those threads right because it's interwoven into the country and that's the thing that creates turn on if we're going to read something we should be reading about us we should be reading about us all. And that's what you're saying. You're saying that that's part of the turn on here for the kids who who and the teachers who are involved in Teach for America. Let's just quickly uh, uh, talk about some of the practical uh, aspects. How many kids do you affect on an annual basis and how many people are involved in your work? So for Teach for America nationally, um, we have now over 60,000 plus alums. So those are folks that have done Teach for America that are you know, still in education or working in other fields that impact local communities. Um, we are the largest supplier of diverse educators in the country, the largest supplier of STEM educators in the country. And annually we'll, we'll serve or impact you know, well over 200,000 students. Um, you know, this upcoming year, we actually, because there's been such a hard time in education, 
um, we're actually trending ahead of where we thought we would be, where we have uh, 2,400 new teachers that are going to start this summer and get ready for the fall. And that's pretty remarkable considering um, education as a, as a point of entry in a sector has had a really hard time during COVID. And we saw declining applications, not just to Teach for America, but to school of eds across the country. So um, I'm really excited about this incoming cohort of first year teachers that are starting um, this summer with their summer pre-service and then in the school year in the fall. In the Twin Cities in particular, we have almost a thousand alums uh, who've done Teach for America here in Minnesota. And more than 50% of those alums are still in school-based roles. So I'm really excited. May is oftentimes Teacher Appreciation Month. Our team just went out and delivered um, some goodies and treats to our teachers to celebrate them. But they're doing incredible work here in the Twin Cities communities uh, across several schools, both charter schools, public schools, and a number of our alums um, are still working in the education workforce. And then for our alums that are not working in education, I think about how powerful it is to have somebody in the public defender's office or someone that's a pediatrician that has actually spent time in the classroom with kids. That's part of our theory of change too. Like it's not about the two-year commitment to work in a low-income school or under-resourced school. It's about that lifetime commitment to being an advocate for education equity and to make sure you're partnering um, to support the well-being of students and families. And a number of our alums carry that out. Um, some of them are on the school board um, in our community. Some of them are on city council. And part of that is really designed to help them understand where is their uh, ability for them to enact change that allows us to see more students learning, leading, and thriving in the Twin Cities. And if you're going to unite here in this, these United States, what better cause to unite behind than the education of children? The Keisha Nation for T Teach for America, Twin Cities, Thank you so much for explaining the content of your programs, the work that you do. Please thank your board, thank your uh, donors, thank your staff, and most of all, please thank your teachers who are doing the work, the work of building the country. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark.